For the last several weeks, we have been taking a look at a part of one evening when Jesus and his disciples shared a Passover supper. And in that, he instituted some additional aspects to that. And he's been teaching. And he's going to continue to teach. And for the next several weeks, we're going to continue to look at his teaching during that evening. For in a few hours from this time that we're talking, he will be arrested and taken from his disciples. And so he's taking this opportunity to teach them. And the best way I can describe it is if you are working for your employer and he's or she is going to be leaving for vacation or whatever and, and that person is giving you instructions on what they want you to do while they're gone and they might say something about, well, uh, pay particular attention to the Smith account. And you think, okay, well, since that person's been telling you then the Smith account is pretty important and, and I need to look at it. Well, if during the period of time before uh, your employer leaves, he or she says several times, pay attention to the Smith account. Here's a little secret. The Smith account is really important to your boss. Jesus is going to use several themes throughout his teaching and he's going to circle back. He'll introduce something new, and then he's going to circle back to certain teachings. And so we as his disciples, we as claiming to be him to be our Lord, not just our boss, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. If we take what he is and says seriously, then what he's telling his disciples towards the end of his earthly ministry, then we need to pay particularly attention. Uh, attention to it, especially when he repeats himself. And so that's what he's going to do. He's going to initially, in what we're looking at, introduce something new, and then he's going to... So in uh, uh, John chapter 14, starting with verse 16, it says this, I will ask the Father. I'm going to stop there. In English, we use the word ask, which means we have a we're going to ask somebody to do something. In the Greek, they have a couple of different versions of ask, just like we have, uh, they have several versions of love. We have love. They have uh, romantic love. They have brotherly love. They have godly love. They have those types of things. Well, in the Greek, there are a couple of types of ask. One is asking from an inferior to a superior position. So using the analogy of the boss, if you go into your boss's office and say, I would like a raise, you're asking, but you're asking from the position of being an employee. So you're not guaranteed to receive that because it's an inferior person asking a superior person. In this situation, this Greek ask is people who are on the same level. It's one level so it'd be like a brother asking a brother for something. So when Jesus says, I will ask the Father, this says Jesus and the Father are on equal footing, which is again is another aspect of the Trinity that we have difficulty with, that Jesus and the Father. So he goes, when I ask the Father, it's not like, oh, please, Father. It's equals asking something. So I will ask the Father and he will not might, he will give you another helper, someone else similar to who I am. So Jesus, if you will, is their helper, their teacher, their leader, their person. But Jesus is saying, I'm going, guys, but I'm going to ask the Father to give you one, something similar to me to be your helper, to be your paraclete, that he may be with you forever. Jesus said, now I've just told you, I'm going to leave for a little while and I'll be back. But this other helper, this another helper is never going to leave you. That is the spirit of truth. So in case they're not quite sure, well, well who's this other helper? What is, he says that this one is going to be with you forever. And that person is 
the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, I always find interesting, you'll, you'll hear people who will talk about being spiritual, although they, they die, there is a God, which I always find kind of humorous because if there is no God, this is all material things, then there is no spiritual. It's just a bunch of muck. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to give the helper. I'm going to give you this spirit to be with you forever because you see the Father, you see me, you believe in me, and therefore I'm going to give the spirit to you. But not everyone's going to get the spirit. We're not all God's children in the sense of being children. Of God. We are all made in the image of God, but we are all not all destined to know who he is because you know him because he abides with you. Now, later I'm going to talk about by later in a couple of weeks from now, this word abide, because we don't use it a lot. About the only way we use abide uh, today is you might hear it in a movie where, where somebody in the 1800s will say, well, I won't abide by that. But we kind of drop that word from our usage, and it has a couple of different meanings. So this is a little teaser for uh, weeks to come. But, but, but because the Spirit's going to abide with you and will be in you. So this difference is different in the fact that they are with Jesus, but at this point, Jesus not in them. But this another helper will not only be with them, he will be in them. For you see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and do special things for special people for special times. But he did not always dwell with them. Jesus is saying, there's going to be a new economy after I leave. And that is, this spirit will dwell in you. So he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus says, I'm, I'm leaving. But you're not going to be as an orphan. You're not going to be one who is unprotected. You're not going to be one who is unprovided for. You will still have parents, if you will. The Father was going to be there. The Spirit's going to be there. So I'm providing for you while I'm gone. So you don't need to worry. You're not going to be unprotected while I'm gone. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will also live. So Jesus is giving them some information that's still a little bit mysterious. He's going, you won't see me, you won't see me, you're going to, but I'm going to live and you're going to live. Now, knowing this full story afterwards, we know what Jesus is talking about. At this point, the disciples are still a little unsure because there's, let's face it, there's a whole lot of information Jesus is giving them at this final period of time. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So Jesus, when what's going to happen in hours and days away, you will know what I've been teaching you is true. And not only will the Spirit be in you, but I will be in you, and you will live. And then Jesus now is going to circle back around. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. So Jesus again. So apparently this is really important. To love Jesus is to keep his commandments. Now there is a company that has a, a slogan. I'm going to drop the first word. What Jesus is saying is, do it. Jesus is saying, it's not just enough for you to know what my commandments are. 
The Pharisees knew all the commandments. The Pharisees not only were so proud of knowing the commandments, they made a whole bunch of other ones so that you couldn't violate the commandments, and yet they violated not only the commandments, but the spirit of the commandments. Jesus said, that's not who I'm looking for. If you say you love me, then you do what I tell you to do. And I'll keep repeating this, and I'll keep repeating this. We love to say that Jesus loves us, and he does. And we'll say that we love Jesus. But do we love Jesus if we don't do what he tells us to do? And the answer, according to Jesus, is no. If he says, you're to love one another as I have loved you, and you refuse to love one another as he's loved us, then you're not doing what he told us to do. But notice, it says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. So not only do we love Jesus by doing what Jesus says, then the father wraps around and loves us because we do what Jesus tells us to do. And that he then will disclose himself, that we will truly know who Jesus is. Is it no wonder that the church seems not to know who Jesus is at times? Because we don't do what he tells us to do. It's kind of like the joke about the new pastor who comes to the church and preaches a message, and it's a pretty good message, and, and everybody walks out saying, you know, good message, pastor. And the next week he preaches the very same message, and, you know, everybody thinks it's a little odd, but, Okay, and they good message, and he does it for four weeks in a row. Finally, the chairman deacons goes, uh, "Don't you have any other messages?" And the pastor says, "Oh, sure." And he goes, "Well, why don't you preach them?" And he goes, "Because I'm waiting for you to do this one first. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. Here's here's something you need to do. You need to love one another, not just warm fuzzy, but you need to love one another as I have loved you. You doing it?" Why should I tell you something else to do if you're not doing that? But when you do that, I will disclose myself even more. And there are all kinds of books about getting to know God. Well, here's a simple way without spending $14.95 on a book. Do what he tells us to do. Verse 22, Judas, Judas not Iscariot. Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, several of the disciples have the same names and some of them have the same parents. So Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are not going to disclose yourself, that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? So you see, Judas, like the rest of the disciples, are a little confused because they believe and know that Jesus is the Messiah. They can't wait for the Messiah to declare himself so that they can get Rome out of there and they can set up their own power and move on and so the whole point of the messiah is to disclose himself so that everybody can rally around him and start marching off he's going wait a minute what changed are you afraid that the people are going to arrest you are you are, are 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 you somehow being intimidated by the situation what happened that now you're you're only going to disclose yourself to us but not to the world Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Jesus, you just told us that. And you told us that in the messages that I brought before. So guess what? This is really important to Jesus. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. We're going to live with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my word. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Jesus is saying, what I'm telling you, I'm telling you because the father told me to tell you. And what the father told me to tell you is you're to keep my word 
And by keeping my word, we're going to dwell with you. It's not that we're going to check in and, and, and pay you a visit. It's not like we're going to spend Christmas vacation with you. We're going to live with you permanently. We're going to reside with you in you. Here is a perfect description of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are dwelling in the believer. And he who does not love me does not keep my word, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. So again, Jesus keeps telling us he's not just making this up. His message comes from the Father. But he keeps telling us, if you love me, you will do. If you love me, you will do. Now, as one who believes, because the scriptures teach it, that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. It also tells us that we cannot love God who we do not see if we do not love our brother who we do see. So the way we prove our love for him is doing what he tells us to do. It's not a matter of whether I'm saved by doing the right thing. It is a matter of whether he is my Lord, because as my Lord, I do what he says. I just don't write a bunch of neat sayings, you know, love God, love your neighbor, you know. That's not the point. It's to know it and to do it. These things, verse 25, I have spoken to you while abiding with you. Not only has he spoken, he has continued to repeat himself. This is the Smith account. It's important. This is the Smith account. It's important. This is the Smith account. It is important. Love one another. Do what I tell you. You want to show that you love me? Love. These things I have spoken to you while abiding, while living with you, while hanging out with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Remember, he started off in our message here is that I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to send another helper. There's no doubt that God is going to send the helper as Jesus has asked him to do it in his name. And whatever is asked in Jesus' name, that will be done. Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now here's one of the things that it seems that critics of the scriptures do not understand. First off, there's some additional things that the disciples need to know. But Jesus doesn't have the time to teach them because they're having difficulty. But they're going to be really open-minded in a few days. And then he's going to continue to teach. And then he's going to send the Holy Spirit to continue to teach them. Just as, if you will the Holy Spirit continues to teach you and me. We read the scriptures and sometimes they don't make any sense. And sometimes God sends a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or somebody knowledgeable of the scriptures to go, oh, that's what he's talking about. And sometimes we read it and we read another passage and go, oh, the Holy Spirit just put that scripture and that scripture and I put them together. Duh, why didn't I see it before? Because the Spirit teaches us. But not only did the Spirit teach them, the Spirit is also going to draw all things into their remembrance. So while they're confused with what Jesus is talking about, he says, the Holy Spirit is going to come back and he's going to remind you what I taught you. So all the critics are all concerned about, well, was there a Q source or was there this? Or did, did 
John write from here, and did Matthew copy Mark, and, and everybody's there. And going, they all leave out the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, remember when Jesus taught that? Remember when Jesus did this? And yeah, Jesus did that, but you can, because that's not going to bring people to faith. This is what you need to do, because you only got a limited amount of scroll space. So write what you need to write to produce faith. And so the Holy Spirit is going to draw them into remembrance of the things that Jesus did and said. All that I said to you, verse 27, peace I leave with you. So again, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving. I'm sending you another helper. But he's also saying, peace I leave with you. I'm not taking that. I'm going to give you another helper, but I'm leaving peace. My peace I give to you. Jesus is giving his peace. Now, in all the times that we have taken a look at the earthly life and ministry of Jesus, ever seen him anxious? Ever seen him doubting? His peace. He's leaving with them. And in case they don't quite understand, not as the world gives you, do I give to you. What kind of peace does the world give? At best, what the world gives is an absence of againstness. We're no longer at war with something, so we're at peace. The peace that Jesus gives is not just an absence of hostility. It is reconciliation. It is when you are with someone, it's not like we're not, it's not that we're enemies, we're just neutral. No, no. Jesus' peace is reconciliation, that you are family. The world gives peace of either absence of hostility, or as long as everything is going fine, everything is fine. But the peace that Jesus gives us is that even when the whole world falls apart, we can be still and know that he's God. Do not let your heart be troubled. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? He started off his teaching, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus again is going back. I'm leaving. This is what you're going to do. Don't worry. I'm giving you peace. Don't let your heart be troubled. Nor let it be fearful. In the book of Joshua, when God is talking to Joshua about getting ready to take the promised land, I forgot how many times, but there are numerous times when God tells Joshua to be courageous, to be courageous, to be courageous. Because one of the great enemies of spiritual warfare is fear. And he says, not only don't be troubled, but don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away. And I will come to you. And he's been repeating, and he keeps on that theme. I'm leaving, but I'm giving you. I'm leaving, but here's what to do. I'm leaving, but don't panic. I'm leaving, here's a helper. I'm leaving, love one another. He keeps going back and forth. But now he's going to go some little nitty gritty. You heard I say to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, let's face it. If we were there with the disciples, we'd go, yeah, but Jesus, if you love me, you'll hang around. You know, it's always about us, isn't it? Jesus, if you really loved me, you wouldn't leave. 
And Jesus has turned around and said, if you love me, you'll want me to leave. Because I'm going to go to the Father. It's a matter of perspective. It's kind of like death. From our perspective, from this side of, of life, we think it's terrible. Oh, person died and, you know, they were 97. And sometimes we think, well, they lived a long life. They're 13. Oh, what a short time. But from our perspective, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. But the scriptures tell us, blessed in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. So from Jesus' perspective, he's going, I'm going back to the Father. That's a great thing. And if you love me, you would say, that's awesome. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. You see, Jesus is telling them these things, not necessarily just to tell them these things, but his whole point is to get them to activate their faith. Jesus understands that what's going to happen is going to happen because that is why he came. It's not taken him by surprise. It's not as the world says, oh, he got wrapped up in, in events that he couldn't control. No, he's in control. He's telling us these things that are going to happen so that we have confidence that he knows about tomorrow. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. You see, Jesus understands that Satan is going to do what Satan does. But Satan is playing into the plans of God. Because the very reason that Jesus came was not just to teach. The very reason that Jesus came was not just to heal. The very reason that Jesus came was to give his life as a ransom for many. And his time is limited. And Satan has nothing to do with him. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. I want you to understand something. The world has no clue about the Father. It thinks it does. And everybody has opinions about who Jesus is. And yet there's going to come a time when even the most ardent atheist is going to bow and confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is obedient to the Father so that the world may understand who he is and why he came and that he will give glory to God. So we, as disciples, are just like these disciples who are learning from Jesus. He's not now here. So what are we doing? We can come and we can worship and we can sing and we can do all those things. And that's good. I'm not being critical of those things. But notice in all of his teaching, he is yet to say, They'll know that you love me because you never miss church. They'll know that you love me because you sang in the choir. They'll know that you love me because you taught Sunday school. They'll know that you love me because you were the pastor of an awesome ministry. He says, they will know that you love me 
because you have love for one another. You will know, they will know that you're my disciples because you have love one for another. You will know that you love me because you love those I love. And if you don't love those that I love, maybe you ought to check out your faith. It's an excellent way to be a fruit inspector of yourself. God hasn't called us to be fruit inspectors of other people. He has called us to be fruit inspectors of ourselves. And we are to say, okay, during the last few hours of his earthly ministry, pre-crucifixion, am I doing what he said is important? And one of the ways that we know is not that we've perfected it, but it is our desire to please him by doing what he says. And by understanding that there are times that we need help. Because let's face it, y'all aren't as easy to love as it is to love me, okay? I know it's really easy to love me, but some of you, not, not quite as easy. So you need a helper to live in you, to dwell in you, and to love the way God loves because you need to help. You all know I'm being facetious here. The Spirit has come to teach us. The Spirit has come to dwell in us. The Spirit has come to show us how to be like Him. And one of the ways that you know that the spirit dwells in you and not pepperoni pizza because you're doing what he told you to do. So if you have a kind of a funny feeling after you've eaten pizza and you have no desire to love one another, then maybe it's just pepperoni pizza. But if you have this unexpressible need to love the people of God, to love them better than you're doing now and asking for a helper to help out. You know, it's the spirit dwelling in you, producing fruit, producing desire. And it is the spirit who teaches us and who draws us closer to God. And it is the spirit who tells about Jesus and brings the world to his knowledge. In a moment, we're going to sing the song of the spirit and the bride, because it is the church's desire that people come to God. And it is the spirit's desire that people come to God. We are in agreement because the spirit dwells in the church and the church dwells because of the spirit. So the call to action, the the call, if you will, not to come forward, but the call is to go out and to love as Jesus loved. And all God's people said.